So hello everybody and thanks for joining us today. We hope everyone is well and in good spirit. Welcome to the series of webinars organized in the framework of the MedGoal project. Today, we are going to host our second webinar. During the webinar, we will learn about the differences among the timescales of climate services for agriculture. We will have six presenters that will describe what we mean when we talk about weather forecasts and also how different these weather forecasts are from seasonal predictions, decadal predictions and climate projections. Probably all of you uh, have heard these terms before and today you will be able to clarify concepts and also to solve your doubts. Before starting, let me shortly introduce the MedGoal project. MedGoal is a four-year project that is funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. It has the aim to contribute to make the European agriculture and food systems more resilient, sustainable and efficient in the face of climate change by using climate services. My name is Marta Terrado from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and I am part of the MedGoal project communication team. I will be moderating our webinar today with the help of my colleague Ilaria Vigo, also from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Just some technicalities before starting. First, I would like to inform all of you that this webinar is being recorded. As I said, we will have six uh, short presentations of around five minutes each. During the presentations, you will be able to write your questions at any time using the chat box. To find it, you just need to go to the control panel on the upper right corner of your screen, select the menu questions, and then type your question and click send. You, we will be collecting uh, all your questions during the presentations and we'll ask them to the speakers when all the presentations are over. To finish with this introduction, let me just briefly now introduce our speakers. We have a multidisciplinary group with us today here. The group is constituted by three climate scientists that will be in charge of the first block of the presentations about the timescales of climate services for agriculture. They are Nube González Revidiego from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center in Spain, Andrea Toretti from the Joint Research Center from the European Commission in Italy, and Christos Giannakopoulos from the National Observatory of Athens in Greece. In addition, we also have three speakers um, from, uh, that are agriculture stakeholders and that are involved also in the project consortium. They will be in charge of providing examples of the application of climate services to the Mediterranean sectors of grape and wine, olives and olive oil, and finally durum wheat and pasta. These presenters are Antonio Grassa from Sogrape Vignos in Portugal, Valentina Manstreta from Orta Spinoff in Italy, and last but not least, Javier López from the cooperative De Cop in Spain. And let's move uh, to, to the first block of the presentations uh, that will be on the timescales of, of climate services for agriculture. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to, to start this presentation by showing you a familiar concept that is the, the weather prediction. Weather prediction provides precise information about temperature, precipitation or wind for a specific location, an hour and for the following few days. However, it's not possible to predict the weather farther than 10 or 15 days. Next, please. If we consider the blue arrow as a timeline, the box on the left represents the weather prediction, providing information for the following days. And the box on the right corresponds to the climate change projection, which provides information for the next century. In between weather forecast and climate change projection are the climate prediction. Next, please. So climate prediction can be divided in three big groups. Subseasonal prediction that provide information for the following one to four weeks. Seasonal prediction that cover from next month up to several months into the future. 
and decadal prediction that encompass information for the following one to 10 years. But what does the information coming from climate prediction look like? I will show you in the next slide. Here you have an example of a typical information obtained from climate prediction of temperature. For a particular area or point, the prediction gives you the probabilities of having below normal, normal or above normal temperature condition, considering normal condition the mean temperature of the past 20 or 30 years. Next, please. For an entire region, as Europe on the right figure, the prediction is a map showing the most probable condition for temperature in each grid point. Below normal condition are represented by blue colors, normal condition by yellows, and above normal condition by reds. If we select a, a point in Portugal, for instance, next please, the blue color means that most probably below normal temperature condition will be expected with a probability of 58%, as you can see in the plot on the left. How these predictions are made is what I'll explain in my next slide. Climate predictions are obtained from models. These models use the observed state of the different components of the climate system, such as the atmosphere, ocean, sea ice, snow cover, etc., to predict a range of possible prediction for the future. Now, if we separate this possible prediction in three groups, one for below normal condition, other for normal, and other for above normal condition, we will obtain, next please, the probabilities of future temperature condition that I have already explained in my previous slide. But before to obtain this map with temperature condition, next please, we correct possible biases due to model imperfection and make an assessment of the prediction quality. Next, please. Finally, I would like to explain to you the concept of prediction skill, because you will find it here and there when you look at, when you look at climate prediction. Uh, in easy words, we could say that the skill is the quality of the prediction. If the skill is positive, color regions in the map, then there is an added value in using prediction over the use of past observation. Next, please. But it's important to know that the skill changes from region to region, as you can see in, uh, in this map, in which white represent areas without a skill. Next, please. Uh, the skill also changes from, from one month to the following or from one season to the next. And you can, as you can see in this animation, go ahead, Marta, please. So you have seen that the white are moving to different regions depending on the month. And finally, the skill uh, also changes with temporal scale. This means that, for instance, the skill of weather prediction represented by the blue line is higher in the first days than the skill of climate prediction for the next few weeks and months represented by orange and purple line. This means that the type of decision that, that the user can make with climate prediction are different than the one with weather forecast. So I will stop here my presentation. And um, my colleague Andrea will explain you how climate prediction can be used to fit impact models. Thank you very much, uh, Nube, and good morning, everybody. Uh, so we have seen uh, what can be obtained in terms of seasonal uh, predictions, uh, climate predictions overall, but uh, uh, 
we need to translate this uh, information into something that can be used in the different uh, socioeconomic sectors uh, and for instance uh, agriculture and i will show you here an example of uh, how usually we can translate and use this information uh, in the agricultural sector by coupling uh, um, and using uh, this uh, source of data for uh, uh, crop grow models so we have a set of scenarios uh, from uh, uh, from climate models uh, by uh, describing uh, different potential outcomes of uh, the uh, coming months, so let's say the next six months, then as Nubes explained, we need to post-process this data, for instance, by applying a bias adjustment uh, technique to make uh, this data close to uh, the reality. And then how to obtain a scenarios of or forecast of crop growth development. Let's say, for instance, we are interested in the grow of uh, uh, durum wheat as uh, we are in the MedCold uh, project. We can uh, use a crop grow model or a set of indicators or an hybrid approach combining indices and uh, and plausible evolution for the next uh, uh, months, so let's say six months to, to the end of the growing season, ideally, uh, how, how the crop is going to uh, grow and uh, evolve. And of course, what we need to do, we have to update this information in a kind of continuous and dynamic way. So we cannot just uh, run this uh, operational chain once, because we run at the beginning of the growing season, and then once uh, we have uh, the new release of seasonal forecast, we can run again. So let's say you start in October, in November, you can run again this operational workflow by also taking advantages from uh, the observation that have been taken during the first month. And so on and so on, you can update your information until you reach the end of uh, the growing uh, season. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, and in MedCult, uh, as a as I was saying, we have followed this hybrid approach by combining indices and uh, models, impact models. In this case, agricultural sector, and more specific, specifically in the durum wheat sector, we have used seen indices together with a uh, um, phenological model that is uh, basically simulating the development of uh, durum wheat in the different uh, locations so one could be might be interested in. And as you can see from this uh, uh, from this slide, these 16 indicators, these 16 indices are characterizing different aspects of the growing season that might have negative impacts on uh, crop yield, on crop quality, uh, and so result in losses. So we have heat stress, cold stress, excessive wetness, and hydrological balance. And you see that they are covering different periods uh, that are basically linked to the simulated phenological phase. Hey, yes, hello from me now. Uh, we are moving now to a different time scale. We are moving to climate change projections now. When we are talking about uh, climate simulations that extend to the future decades, uh, typically until uh, 2100, uh, these simulations are obtained by running numerical models. The numerical models either cover the entire globe, uh, in this case, they are called global uh, climate models, or they cover a, a regional of the globe. In this case, they are called regional climate models. Regional climate models uh, are more uh, accurate uh, because they have a finer spatial resolution, but they need to obtain uh, input from global climate models, the initial and boundary conditions in order uh, to be run. Uh, next, please. Uh, but of course, uh, in order to have climate projections uh, for the future in the next uh, 20 to about 100 years, uh, we need to know what the anthropogenic forces are going to be in the future. That means what the future of anthropogenic greenhouse gas concentrations are going to be in the future. And here we have considerable uh, uncertainty because we don't know how the future in anthropogenic uh, gases 
uh, greenhouse gas concentrations uh, is going to evolve. Uh, that's why we use uh, scenarios of uh, uh, concentrations of greenhouse gases and aerosols. These scenarios are adopted by the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. Uh, they affect the, the uh, these are the constituents that affect the planet's radiative balance. Uh, they are called representative concentration pathways and uh, in IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, four uh, regional uh, representative concentration pathways have been chosen. Uh, they are shown uh, in the far right of this uh, slide. Uh, but in Medgold project for the agricultural niche, we have selected uh, just two uh, uh, scenarios the RCP 4.5, which represents a stabilization scenario, uh, which you can say this is a moderate scenario. And we have used also the RCP 8.5, which is the scenario with very high greenhouse gas emissions. Next, please. Uh, but we don't, because we have uh, considerable uncertainties uh, when running the models, we don't just use, we don't just take the climate projections as they are. We need to, to take as many regional climate models projections as possible in order to reduce uncertainty. And of course, we need to, do, to take as many climate change scenarios as I described earlier in order to reduce uncertainty. Uh, 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 then we need to perform an evaluation of the models that we have taken uh, against observations uh, that we have for the region that we are interested uh, either observations or graded observational data sets and use only the regional climate models or the global climate models that have a regional representation of the historical climate. Then we can perform additional bias correction techniques as mentioned before to further improve the regional climate models representations of the historical climate and extremes. And what is this uh, bias correction? Uh, as I said, the outputs from climate models are not useful because they have biases. Either they simulate too high the temperature or too low the rainfall. So they have significant biases in relation to observations because they have limited spatial resolution, uh, the physics is incomplete and we don't know, we cannot uh, include in the models uh, the whole knowledge of the Earth's climate system. Then, so we need to perform a bias correction method. We apply a bias correction which can correct the raw model output using the differences in the mean and variability because mo be between model and observations in the historical period, in the period that we have observations. Next, please. And uh, as Andrea mentioned before, we can use a specific indicator, specific indices of climate, which are specifically made for the agricultural uh, sector that we are interested. Uh, these can be based just on temperature and precipitation, but they can all, uh, also feed, as Andrea said, uh, impact models. Uh, here I will describe, for example, that uh, simple climate indices can be based just on temperature and precipitation precipitation and they can be useful to the agricultural sector of interest, for example, either to the olive sector or the durum wheat sector or the grape wine sector. And they can be useful for the management and decision making for risk associated to the spread of pests, for example, or to diseases or to losses of yield or other climate related threats for uh, cultivations. And in the next slide, please. Uh, I show uh, an example indicator for, uh, for climate projections. Uh, this is the total winter precipitation uh, for the period of October to May. Uh, this is a, a specific indicator that was chosen for the olive yield, so for the olive sector. And uh, we have two plots here. One plot uh, in the left shows you the reference climate, the climate of 1971 to 2000. And in the right plot, we have the differences between the long-term future, uh, the future of uh, 2071 to 2100, 
uh, be, uh, in, in uh, relation to the reference climate, so the changes. And you can see here uh, the region of Andalusia in Spain, which is a very a, a important growing uh, region for olives. Uh, you can see here that there is there are considerable uh, uh, decreases in precipitation, especially in the south and the eastern part uh, of the Andalusian re region, uh, which can uh, reach 20% uh, uh, for the distant future under the scenario, uh, the, the pessimistic scenario, of course, the scenario RCP 8.5. Okay, so thank you, Nube, Andrea, and Christos for your presentations. We will now uh, move to the second block of presentations, one uh, on the different examples of application uh, or to different crops and food systems. Okay, uh, good morning. So um, I am uh, presenting uh, the case study of the grape and wine uh, sector. In this case, um, I work uh, for a large uh, family-owned um, wine company, which has um, a strong commitment uh, to both uh, the sustainability of the business and uh, permanent innovation stance. The company holds uh, vast vineyard uh, areas uh, spanning five countries in uh, three continents. And even within uh, each country, uh, the company owns vineyards in different regions. Uh, for example, in Spain, uh, we have vineyards in four appellations, and in Portugal, we have vineyards in seven appellations. The company is also vertically integrated, meaning we produce grapes, we make wines, we distribute and sell uh, wines in different markets, owning uh, distribution companies. But because of that vertical integration, we also have a strong commitment to passing knowledge to more than 2,000 farmers that are in Portugal alone work with us. Next slide, please. So uh, growing grapes uh, has a, a major challenge from fungal disease, mainly in uh, springtime. In this case, losses may be uh, total if uh, the disease is left unchecked in unfavorable years. Uh, two main operations are involved in order to address this challenge. Uh, one is uh, spraying with protection products and the other is managing the canopy to allow that the protection products reach all parts of the vineyard and namely the bunches. Uh, next click please. So, um, Impact of, uh, may come from loss of yields or increase in operational costs. Most often than not, we have both. Therefore, anticipation of disease pressure may allow for a timely preparation of uh, uh, farmers uh, by um, doing a timely procurement of protection products and uh, managing stocks, contracting labor, maintaining machinery and making it ready, also contracting alternative grape supply, and of course, managing to negotiate better price conditions and avoid also unnecessary costs if the pressure is low. Next slide, please. So in this slide, we are seeing an example of uh, a seasonal forecast um, that uh, could allow the anticipation of a probable situation. Um, the forecast varies uh, with location. As you see, each location have different colors. Uh, on the right side, on the top right side, you see the scale, and that is the same scale that has already been referred before, below normal, normal, or above normal uh, conditions. The forecasts may be compared to historical um, uh, forecasts and observations. That is what you see on the charts on the bottom. Um, and um, uh, um, it, by comparing with historical information, you also have an assessment of uh, historical reliability of forecasts as the observations, which are the blue dots, compare uh, with the, um, the forecasts, which are the rectangles, the colored rectangles. And when they match, you have uh, a year where the observation uh, was, uh, sorry, where the forecast was correct. 
and confirmed uh, by the observations. So in these years, we might have done things differently. We could have secured stocks, we could have secured um, uh, labor, maintenance, also uh, make provisions for peak periods, and of course also prepare stocks and sales for years of world production. Thank you. So let's now move to the durum wheat uh, sector. Next uh, slide, please. And uh, I will present uh, Orta, that is uh, a spin-off company from the Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore in Italy and was born in 2008. Its mission is to increase the value of research by transferring the technological innovation to practical agriculture at national and international level by developing uh, new cropping strategies, methods, and products. The core activity of ORTA is the development of decision support system, that is briefly said as DSS, for sustainable crop production based uh, on uh, information and communication technologies. DSS collects, uh, organize, and integrate all types of information required for producing a crop, then analyze and interpret the information and finally use the analysis to recommend the, the most appropriate action for action, action choices. However, the decision itself is the responsibility of the user and the DSS is not designed to replace the decision maker, but just to help him in making choices by providing, providing additional information. In general, the use of DSS allow a more rational use of external inputs, such as uh, varieties, fertilizer, crop protection products, improving results in terms of both quality and quantity, so increasing the economic return for the farmer. In par particular, the DSS Granoduro.net was designed for the management of durum wheat, and is, it is presently used by farmers in the Barilla supply chain. Barilla is the leading pasta producer in Italy, and it, it is also partner in the Medgold Consortium. Next slide, please. When uh, managing uh, his urine wheat crop, the farmer has to take several decisions, starting from the choice of the wheat variety to be sown, the management of wheat, the crop protection strategy to be, to be applied in order to, to get the best results on yield and quality of the product. Most of these decisions can be informed by climate information at a seasonal time scale. Fertilization is one of the decisions which need to be carefully taken into account by the farmer in order to avoid both the deficiencies or surplus of nutrients for the plant. This decision can benefit from climate information for the relevant period. The amount of nitrogen to be applied, the intervention timing, and the form of nitrogen to be distributed are mainly influenced by soil characteristics, wet variety crop, and the weather during the cropping season, mainly in temperature and precipitation, which drive the effect of fertilizer on the crop. Nitrogen application during the cropping season is normally split in two or three interventions in the, in the period from wet tillering to booting. Timing and amount of nitrogen to be distributed are affected by weather condition experienced during winter and can be, in, and can be informed by, we, by the weather forecast for the following period when the phenological stages are reached. The crop manager also needs to choose the form of nitrogen to be distributed in his field. Nitrogen can be distributed to crops in two forms nitric nitrogen or ammoniacal nitrogen. Nitric nitrogen can be readily used by the plants, but it is more prone to leaching in case of heavy rainfall occurs. Ammoniacal nitrogen is less readily available to plants, but it is not subject to leaching as it can bind to soil particles. Next slide, please. One of the indexes we elaborated to help responding to the complexity of this choice is related to heavy rains during the tillering period. Heavy rain can cause the leaching of nitrogen, causing both loss 
lots of the fertilizer eventually distributed in field and can be a source of pollution for the environment. This index can thus provide useful information to the crop manager on wheat fertilization and on the form of nitrogen to be distributed. First of all, in the upper part of the box, you can see the simulation of the phenological development of durum wheat. On the y-axis, there are the main wheat phenological stages, y on the x-axis, there are the days. The vertical black line indicates the today. Let's pretend we are at the beginning of January. From this moment onward, the seasonal forecasts are used to fit the phenological model, allowing to get a prediction on the period in which the main with the phenological phases will occur. The red bar you see in the lower box is the visualization of the predicted index in this case, the index for heavy rain during, during seedling. The length of the bar represents the period where the, the relevant phenological phase is forecasted. The color of the bar indicates the risk of having, of having heavy rains in this period, with red indicating high risk, yellow mid risk, and green low risk. In this way, the crop manager can have useful information in, the, in advance and beginning to plan the fertilization intervention on its field. Now I will pass the, the presentation to the olive sector. Thank you, Valentina, uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Javier and I will present the OLI application. Uh, the CO is a Spanish multisectorial second degree uh, cooperative with 75,000 family of farmers. Uh, the CO is the largest uh, producer of olive oil and double olive in the world with an average of uh, 225,000 tons of olive oil and 100,000 tons of double olive. Uh, the CO is the olive industrial partner in Medgol in order to provide the point of view from the olive sector in climate service. Uh, one decision to, to the CO is the, um, the olive yield uh, estimation uh, because the olive tree has the peculiarity of alternating uh, a season with a big production with a short production in the next campaign. Um, how we can see in the picture, uh, the, the farmer and olive mills uh, uh, don't have the, the same needs uh, every year. Uh, in conclusion, uh, there is a large uh, difference in the olive oil production every year, but the climate survey could uh, provide information to, to predict uh, the, the production tendency. Uh, Marta, next slide, please. Um, Medgol has organized a, a couple of workshops uh, with the olive sector uh, where the participant identified it, um, the olive yield estimation uh, as a key decision related to uh, temperature and precipitation. And they will uh, need information around 12 months uh, in advance. Uh, in other words, um, a, season, a seasonal forecast uh, as uh, we can see in the picture. Also, uh, the participant uh, concluded, concluded uh, two types of uh, information that will be useful uh, to the um, olive G estimation. On the one hand, uh, the climate variable of total annual precipitation, and on the other hand, uh, free uh, bioclimatic indices uh, were proposed. Uh, one, one was uh, the maximum temperature from April to June. Uh, another uh, was the minimum temperature from November to January. And the last, uh, the last one uh, was the, the total precipitation for October to, to May. Uh, Marta Nis, please. Uh, in my last uh, slide, uh, I show uh, several uh, screenshots uh, from 
the medical dashboard. Uh, for the olive yield estimation, uh, we have uh, selected uh, the monthly precipitation of May uh, 2018. Uh, we see this step on the top of the slides. And with this information, the dashboard uh, provides uh, a map of color that shows the, the area with normal above or below normal uh, precipitation in May. The, the red box, uh, uh, we could say that is the Andalusia region. In the right of the blue color map is uh, the real area of Andalusia. And we have selected uh, a point in, in Andalusia and the dashboard provides uh, a monthly precipitation graphic. Where, the, where we can see the real observation by a point and the seasonal forecast uh, by a bar of um, a monthly uh, precip precipitation. Uh, and now we move on the application climate uh, projection in wind with an olive uh, sector. Uh, Antonio, would you like to start? Okay, thank you, uh, Javier. Um, yes, uh, so um, uh, in terms of uh, climate projections and the application to the, to the grape and wine uh, uh, sector, uh, this brings in uh, some important information that informs on making uh, decisions. Um, uh, next, please. So um, by looking on to how it is expected that uh, in this case, the maximum monthly temperature of August uh, will be distributed in uh, the area shown in the map, in this case, the Douro Valley of uh, Northeast Portugal. Farmers, according to uh, their interests, can decide the sites uh, with better conditions uh, to continue producing high quality grapes and wines uh, for the coming uh, decades, and in this case, up to the end of, of the century. Uh, looking at the, for the, the projected temperatures in each uh, area, they can make decisions about which varieties to uh, plant, uh, which type of wine to make, uh, are, is there a need for irrigation or not, or even verify that ap ap after a certain moment there won't be any more conditions uh, to continue growing grapes with high quality and uh, decide to sell the land or to change uh, crop to another more resistant uh, plant. So, um, uh, next please, Valentina. Yes, uh, climate projections are relevant uh, for several actors in the durum wheat sector too. For example, projection on a time scale for two or three years can inform on the potential yield in the various uh, durum wheat cropping regions. This is uh, particularly relevant for collector and cooperatives, then which can then plan the production and try to define the best uh, strategies for them to market, market their product. Longer time scale uh, scenarios can also be used for, uh, to forecast uh, if uh, the durum wheat production can still be carried out uh, in a sustainable and profitable uh, area, in a profitable way in, uh, in a particular area or to identify if uh, new areas uh, can be devoted, be, can be become be devoted to durum wheat production. And uh, this is uh, also, uh, this can be a relevant information, for example, for the food industries, which can uh, plan the, uh, the purchase of commodities in new areas and uh, do the evaluation of the uh, for over the market of this commodity. Javier, will you talk uh, about the olive sector, please? Thank you, Valentina. Uh, in the case of the olive sector, uh, we can see in the map on the left uh, regarding annual mean temperature uh, that in 50 year, the temperature uh, could increase uh, of four or five degrees Celsius in Andalusia. Uh, this fact uh, could be relevant for the sector, and especially for farmers. Uh, for instance, uh, due to 
this um, this increase uh, no irrigation farm may stop being uh, productive and could need to turn into the irrigated farm another option uh, could be the change of the current uh, olive variety by evaporating uh, more resistant to to drought uh, although both uh, possibility of farm modernization uh, have a cost uh, to the farmers uh, and they need uh, climate information to, to support this critical decision. This is all for, for my side and, and now Marta will go, go on with the webinar. Okay, thank you, uh, Antonio, Valentina and Javier for your presentation. And now that you have seen the different types of forecasts and also the applications that these forecasts have to different agriculture fields, and, and before moving to, to the round of questions, uh, we will try to, to run a poll now. Let's see if it works. Okay, so now you should see in your screen the first of the questions, which is, which crops do you think can benefit the most from seasonal predictions? Remember that seasonal predictions are predictions for the next months and seasons. And uh, you have several options here. You can select more than one if you want. We have grapes, olives, durum wheat, known all crops. So yeah, please uh, participate and then we will see what our audience is, is thinking. I will give you some, some seconds more and then we, we can all together check the results. Okay, I see that now, ah, still there are some people voting. Yeah, I'll leave you some more seconds then. Okay, now we have more than 80% of our audience that has voted, I think. Okay, it's fine. I will close now the poll. And uh, let me share also with you the, the result of our poll. So 60% um, of, uh, of people that participated think that for all crops, and if we look at the individual crops, grapes, olives, durum wheat, also the ones that choose uh, individual crops, uh, we have uh, very similar percentages. Okay. And uh, now, uh, just to finish the poll, we have a second question. Hope it will run also well. So now the, the question uh, is the same, but instead of uh, doing it for seasonal predictions, we will do it for climate projections. So these long-term projections for the next uh, um, 30, 40 years until the end of the century. So the same, what do you think? Uh, for which crops should would these predictions be more useful and you have the same options here grapes olives durum wheat known and all crops as well Also, in the meantime, remember that if you have any question for our speakers, uh, you can you can type your questions on on the chat box, and then we we will be able to to ask them for you to to the relevant speakers. Okay. So we have many people that have already voted, almost ninety percent of the audience. So I think we can we can just close the poll now and I will also share with you the answers so all crops again uh, so I think we have convinced you <laughs> that it's great so okay so now uh, I think the, the, we should move 
um, to the next section, which is uh, the questions and answers. Here is when uh, the moment where you can participate and share your, your questions for the speakers. Um, all questions are valid. I mean, don't be shy. We have already our first question, which is uh, it's for Valentina, this one. Yeah, and the question is from Milena Stefanova about how many farmers use the granoduro.net platform? It's uh, in the order of uh, hundreds, uh, but I actually don't, cannot give you the, the right uh, number. Mm -hmm. okay. But it's uh, a uh, used uh, system. Yeah, but Milena says thank you, Valentina. And uh, we, uh, ah, we, we, this is uh, not uh, actually a question, but someone has shared uh, their view. Yeah, Bertinaria Flavio uh, says uh, that um, I think that it depends on the cultivation environment. Uh, I can grow wheat in, uh, in uh, another territory on an annual base, but I cannot do this with uh, orchards in general yeah so the i think maybe you are referring to to the decisions you you can take as well yeah so we have another question this is a question from emmanuel excel uh, are seasonal forecasts and climate projections freely available for the whole mediterranean regions in copernicus or ecmwf platforms maybe our climate uh, science uh, presenters have some some hints on that and can share their knowledge uh, about if Copernicus and CMWF make this type of predictions available. I mean, if you don't know, uh, you don't know, but... Uh, hey, uh, hello, regarding... Is, um, okay. Mm -hmm. Anna, just to say that, uh, yes, the seasonal forecasts are uh, freely available uh, for the Copernicus Climate Data Store and then can be retrieved, while for climate projections, again, they can be retrieved from the ESGF uh, nodes and they are, of course, uh, 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 so they are now in the uh, um, upload phase because we are in the assessment report phase six of IPCC. Uh, while uh, you uh, people can download uh, every month uh, the new seasonal forecast uh, from C3S, so the Copernicus data store. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Okay, we have uh, another question, which is uh, also addressed to, to climate scientists. Uh, what's the temporal resolution of seasonal forecasts, and will there be availability on a week by week or day by day basis? The the weather the seasonal prediction uh, the aim of seasonal prediction is is to provide information for the for the forthcoming month or season so we can see the the temporal resolution I mean the temporal resolution of the seasonal prediction can be daily you can obtain them daily but then if you want to 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 use it in order to predict something at the end the the information that you have to obtain from the from the seasonal prediction should be at monthly time scales rather than daily okay even if you can obtain the the daily prediction for on copernicus thank you nube for your answer and uh, more questions are keeping uh, keep arriving. So we have one from Giorgio Esperandio, uh, who says, many thanks for the organization of this informative webinar. I have a question about the model skills that was presented in the first presentation. How is it, pos how it is possible to measure the skill of the model? Is this parameter a good indication to choose the predictions that suit uh, the best respect to the area under investigation. Nube, I guess this one is for you as well. 
Mm, yes, I don't know if I understood the last part of the question, sorry. Yeah, the last, the last part was more uh, in terms of if this, the, the, the value of skill, it's a good indication to decide, uh, um, uh, let me see, this parameter, a good indication to choose the predictions that should the best the area under investigation. Yeah, apparently, um, if, if the, the, the question is about if the skill uh, is a good indication to choose those areas uh, that, uh, that are the best uh, to to keep to to be investigated. Uh, maybe you don't understand the question because this is not actually what skill means. So maybe you can clarify what's the concept of skill, and then this will probably answer the question. Okay, maybe maybe can help if you can go to this slide, please, Marta, and share with all of us. But uh, but yes, I mean, the a skill. If if we would like to to define a skill. In, a, in, in an easy term, we can say that the skill is the is representing the quality of the prediction. So, for instance, in this map that uh, is now in the in the screen, in which is represented the skill, you can see uh, white areas in which there are no skills. So the skill is uh, less than zero, and with red color you can see those areas in which the skill is positive. So basically, when you have a positive skill, this means that if you use this, uh, this prediction in the long term, you, can, you will obtain an added value of using this, uh, this prediction over the use of, uh, of the past observation. So basically, this means that is if you have a skill in the prediction, it's better to use climate prediction rather than just climatology. That is the, the mean average of your observation. And then uh, regarding, I mean, if, if you can use this prediction, if you have a skill or no, uh, basically, uh, I would say that uh, you could use climate prediction when the skill is positive above zero. Otherwise, it's better to use uh, past observation rather than uh, climate prediction. So I don't know if I have answered the question. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully yes. Otherwise, Giorgio, let us know and maybe Nube can provide more clarifications. If not during the webinar, after the webinar, because we will try to put all the questions we cannot answer now in in, a, in our forum. Uh, let's uh, pick a couple more of questions and then I think we will need uh, to, to start finishing these, these questions and answers section. So uh, another question is from Tiziana Di Filippis who is asking, is the access to medical services and data open? I think this question uh, is for all of you, because all of us are part of the consortium. So if someone wants to answer, please. I can give uh, first answer, and maybe the others uh, can add more. So the, uh, the for instance, the, the software that uh, we have, uh, we are developing uh, for providing a prototype of uh, services for the Durham Wheat sector is an open source software that uh, is going to be made available to everybody. And data, of course, we have uh, tried to use as much as possible data that can be freely uh, retrieved, for instance, from C3S. Okay, thanks. We have uh, another question. Uh, I don't know if, uh, sorry, if others want to add something, as Andrea said it at the beginning. If uh, it's not the case, I will proceed then with the next question. I think it was quite clear. Uh, Miriam Kroma is asking, what are the challenges, solutions with RCP 8.5 projections for the different types of crops? Should we think to change those crops or there are some adaptation solutions? Uh, maybe I can uh, reply to this one uh, 
because uh, so adaptation is going to play um, uh, an essential role uh, when uh, when we look at climate projections or when we look at the next decades especially for crops uh, such as wheat so for wheat there is uh, a good potential for adaptation especially uh, i mean in the european and the mediterranean regions of course there will be still challenges but adaptation can play a big role uh, based on our uh, simulations, uh, the, the um, mice, for instance, uh, uh, has a limited adaptation potential for different reasons because it's mainly linked to irrigation, uh, so it will be mostly affected by uh, climate change. Uh, of course, uh, um, we need to also to investigate, and this is something that more difficult, what could uh, change in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, high-level management practices. Uh, for instance, if new rotational patterns will be introduced uh, uh, and so on. Okay, thank you, may Andrea. I, yeah. May I also add something there, Martin? Of course, of course. Go ahead, Antonio. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, from the standpoint of uh, the grape and wine business, um, and considering that uh, this is an industry that is very much dependent on the place where uh, you are, you where you are producing, um, uh, the, the 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 forecast evolution of uh, of climate will pose a number of challenges and also open a number of opportunities. Uh, there is a, a potential for adaptation in every in every area, but that potential in, is limited up to a certain point where you cannot continue to produce the same type of wine um, uh, because it's becoming too hot or too or too dry. Um, for a, for a, a clear example, if you are producing um, a sparkling wine. Uh, like Prosecco or, or, or Champagne or Cava, um, you need acidity. And acidity is um, usually, de it usually decreases with uh, high, high temperatures and, uh, and with the drought. So um, there may come to a point that if the, the temperature increasing and also the, the rainfall decreasing will uh, make it um, uh, maybe not impossible, but just too expensive to compensate for the lack of acidity in, uh, in, in producing a sparkling wine. And therefore, at that moment, you will attain the limit of your adaptation and uh, you can then choose to make other type of wine or uh, find another place where, uh, where to produce a sparkling wine. As I said, uh, at the same time as there will be uh, uh, areas that will be facing um, increased constraints, there will be other areas that are not used today to produce wine and that will become suitable as, as climate uh, uh, increases. In any case, RCP 8.5, I believe, is a scenario that no one wants to, 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 to happen. And uh, I, I fear that we will be worried with a lot more um, uh, pressing issues rather than actually uh, producing wine if such a scenario happens to materialize. Uh, Antonio, and you mentioned this, um, this solution, what well, is adaptation about uh, changing place uh, or changing uh, the grape variety, and this is very much in line with a question that we received from Julieta Costa. Uh, she is asking, are there any adaptations that grape producers can adopt in view of the temperature rise that allow them to keep the vines? Because your two solutions, not exactly keeping the vines. Can you think of any adaptations of this kind or uh, what you mentioned is what it is? No, I think there are several other adaptations. I just mentioned the most obvious ones and the ones that are easily understandable. Um, it also depends a lot on the place where you are. Uh, if you have ready water availability, that would be the first adaptation that you can use is start irrigating in order to uh, counter the effect of higher temperature. Um, uh, the grapevine uses water most than anything else uh, to cool its tissues in order to keep on uh, um, uh, um, uh, photosynthesizing and producing uh, the, the energy it needs and also the compounds that uh, make the grapes rich and uh, and uh, suitable to produce uh, wine. 
Uh, you can also use protective measures uh, like um, uh, um, radiation protection. There are a number of products, uh, kaolin being one of those, and also calcium carbonate and, and some others are available that will decrease um, the, the, radi the radiation um, uh, attaining the tissues of the leaves and therefore uh, uh, increasing the temperature of the leaves. Other measures can be, uh, uh, as I said, uh, changing the grape variety and even keeping the grape variety but changing the clone to more tolerant clones to drought or, um, or uh, high temperature. And a number of uh, work has been uh, coming out very, uh, recently in terms of how to use uh, grapevine diversity uh, both at the varietal and at, and at the clonal level to um, adapt uh, to, uh, to, to the increasing uh, temperatures. Um, also, a number of um, physical covers are being uh, uh, trialed. Uh, a famous example has been trialed in the southern France using solar panels to um, create a shade onto the vineyards and at the same time uh, to, to produce electrical power that can be used for the, the pumps in the irrigation system or even for uh, uh, partial use on the wineries or, or, or other buildings. So yes, there are many different adaptation um, uh, possibilities, yet there is a, a, a limit for adaptation. And I think that the climate projections better, best uh, um, contribution is exactly to give an idea for any, per, any site, any place, what is the expected date in the future that that adaptation limits will come to be for the type of wine that is being produced there? So that uh, when you when you address that, you can think what would you do and how uh, and uh, how you could uh, um, keep your profitability and your revenues even under that situation. If you have time to plan, you will be better prepared, and that is the main uh, added value of um, of climate projections. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Antonio, for the very comprehensive answer. And uh, well, uh, the webinar has already been running for one hour, so unfortunately, we need uh, to wrap up. Um, so I would like, uh, before closing, I would like to let you know that all the questions in the chat that we haven't had the chance to discuss here will be uploaded uh, to the MedGol forum and our presenters will answer them there. So the discussion can be further continued if you are interested. You will receive the link to the forum by email after this, um, after this webinar. The webinar recording also, together with the presentations that our speakers have been using, will be uploaded to the MedGol website. For those interested, there you will also find information on how to join the MedWall community and to, keep, to be informed and up to date on the different activities that we organize in the project. And for any other doubt or question, please um, feel free to, to reach us uh, at this contact email. Other webinars will be organized as well, so stay tuned uh, for future announcements. I would like to finalize, to finalize thanking our speakers for the very clear presentations and also our audience for having spent your time uh, with us uh, today. I hope you have enjoyed the webinar uh, and have uh, a nice afternoon, all of you, and keep safe. Bye-bye.